Hello, my name is Lydia Brandt, and I'm a professor of architectural history at the University of South Carolina. I'm also a former fellow, twice, of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. Today, I'm gonna to talk with you about how architecture communicates ideas, and in particular, how buildings that look like Mount Vernon talk to us. Let's get started. Architecture is like any other visual art. It uses features not only for practical reasons, but also to tell us things. Different architectural cues mean different things in different cultures to different people and at different times. Let's begin with this house, which is just up the road from Mount Vernon in Virginia and was probably built in the 1970s. What words would you use to describe this house? maybe words like traditional, colonial, or American. Now think about why those words came to you. What gives you the impression of traditional, colonial, or American? Let's break down the features to understand what this building is saying. First, we have shutters. Now, these shutters are affixed to the wall. They do not open or close. So what are they there for? In colonial architecture, real colonial architecture, shutters were used to protect windows, the glass especially, which was expensive and imported. But that's not what's happening here. Second, notice the chimneys on either side of the house. This house was built with central heating and air, for sure. So these chimneys definitely aren't heating anything, at least for any reason other than Christmas morning, creating a kind of atmosphere. So what are they doing there? Well, these two features, even though they're no longer functional in this house, remind us of traditional domestic architecture, and in particular, traditional domestic American architecture. By traditional, I mean the kind of elite architecture that was popular in the colonial period. Now, let's talk about the one big feature on the front of this building, the porch. Porches like this shade the interior spaces of the home. They also give a really nice place to sit on hot summer days, particularly good in the South. The details are a little bit classical. You have dentals, those little teeth along the entablature, but also you have these box capitals at the top of the columns. But this porch also connects us to something much more specific and something we know pretty well, Mount Vernon. This porch ties this house to Mount Vernon specifically. The people who built this house clearly wanted to reference Mount Vernon just up the road. So how do we get here? How does Mount Vernon's porch end up on a suburban house probably built in the 1970s? Here we get to my thesis. Mount Vernon is the most widely replicated building in American architecture. Its famed piazza, along with other distinctive architectural features I'll remind you of today, have appeared on more different kinds of buildings in more far-flung places than any other building in the United States. You see Mount Vernon's piazza on a private home in Connecticut from the 1890s, in a design for an attractive women's prison from the 1930s that was never built abstracted in national airports design from the 1940s, and in a 1980s Los Angeles bank. But how and why does America come to replicate Mount Vernon in all of these different places for all of these different purposes and in all of these different contexts? The answer to this question is pretty complicated, but I'll narrow it down to three main reasons today. Number one, Mount Vernon is connected to Washington, America's superhero, largely agreed upon throughout America's history as its most famous and perhaps most admirable public figure. Second of all, Mount Vernon is recognizable. Americans know from a very early period, even before Washington's death, what Mount Vernon looks like, its architecture, and its basic history. If you're looking to communicate ideas about yourself, your building, your business, your family, then you can bet others will recognize Mount Vernon and make efficient connections between your ideas and larger national ones. Third, Mount Vernon's architecture is malleable 
Because it's so recognizable and has been admired for so long, Mount Vernon's architecture can be used to represent many different points of view. A private home, a women's prison, an airport, a bank, they all work, and they all work at the same time. Mount Vernon is flexible. So let's begin at the beginning. George Washington was very conscious of his public image. He crafted it throughout his life to communicate different things. His house was an important part of this self-fashioning. He meant for Mount Vernon to communicate very specific things about himself, and he continually reimagined the house to reflect his public image. He added spaces that were needed to accommodate his increasingly public life. And he intended the house to be impressive and of the latest fashion, to reflect his gentility and his knowledge of what was hot and what was not. But he also wanted Mount Vernon throughout his life to represent his restraint and humility. This was the delicate balance of Washington's public character and the image that he projected through his private house. Washington inherited the house from his brother in the 1750s and went about enlarging it within a few years. He doubled the house in size, raising the roof to go from one and a half stories to two and a half. He built a grander staircase, and he also starts paneling the walls in the hall and the parlors after the latest English fashion. But why? Washington wanted to be considered a gentleman, and a house was a surefire way for him to rise in the social ranks. This became especially important when he brought home a new wife and her children. Washington married Martha Dandridge Custis in 1759, and she brought Jackie and Patsy with her to Mount Vernon. The new house made room for his new family, as well as his new fortune that came with the new bride. In 1773, on the brink of the Revolutionary War, Washington begins making another significant round of changes. Most of these would be taken care of from afar as he was fighting in the Revolutionary War. This second round of renovations takes more than 10 years to complete and was largely finished by 1787, just before he comes president. So why enlarge and alter the house again? Well, Washington was becoming a public figure a public figure in a new and very visible republic. He will need a bigger house with more public spaces and distinctly private ones, but he's also going to need a house that projects his public image. So he doubles the size of the house again to reflect these two related needs. He adds a two-story dining room to accommodate the big time entertaining that he and Martha are doing now that he's a rising politician and military leader, as well as to showcase his increasingly impressive art collection. He adds an addition on the other side of the house with a bedroom on the second floor and a study below, accessed by its own stair. He needs a place that can be quiet and private in this house that is becoming increasingly an almost public space. But now Washington's house has a new problem. The house is really, really long. It's kind of gangly, and it's certainly outside the neoclassical proportions that he was supposedly imitating. So Washington comes up with a series of solutions to bring the composition together. On the west side of the building, he adds a pediment found on ancient classical buildings like temples and increasingly found on American public buildings. He also adds a cupola found on courthouses and churches at the time. He begins these particular changes in 1777 once he has been chosen to lead the Continental Army. What we see here in the architecture of Mount Vernon is Washington recognizing that his house and he are special. He needs to distinguish Mount Vernon from other houses to represent the fact that he is becoming a new kind of leader, and he's using architectural features that are often used in public architecture. On the east side, he has an entirely different solution to the really long composition problem. He adds this really long porch. While this shades the rooms on this side of the house, and as anyone who's been to Mount Vernon on a hot summer day knows, creates this really lovely place to admire the Potomac River, it also ties this side of the building together with a unique architectural feature. 
we do not know where Washington got the idea for this long piazza. There are a variety of sources, but his ultimate source is unknown. What we end up with at Mount Vernon is a very personal essay in architecture and a very idiosyncratic building. Mount Vernon has really distinct features. The piazza, the cupola, the pediment, the long elevations, all of these things combined. But there's also a very specific reason for each feature, rooted in Washington's particular taste and his desire to communicate ideas about himself and his role in the changing and forming American society. Washington clearly loved Mount Vernon and Americans responded. People were immediately curious about the home of the great president and the general. And Washington recognized this. He wrote to his farm manager, William Pierce, in 1794, I have no objection to any sober or orderly person gratifying their curiosity in viewing the buildings, gardens, and etc. about Mount Vernon. Washington designed the house to anticipate this curiosity and the fact that people would use the house as a lens to understand him. And it worked. Early Americans did associate Mount Vernon with Washington. And here's where we get the second reason why Mount Vernon became so replicated. It was recognizable. Americans begin to see Mount Vernon's image repeated in prints even before Washington's death. And often the mention of this house is quite small and brief. You just get a little porch, a little cupola, and sometimes a glimpse of the Potomac River view. As the technologies for transfer printing, the transportation of goods, and color images improve, Mount Vernon's image is everywhere by the end of the 19th century. There were many, many opportunities for Americans to see or confirm what it looked like. So Mount Vernon's distinctive architectural features, determined by Washington himself, only made it easier to spot and then connect the house to the man. The preservation of the house by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association only made it more recognizable and gave people even more of a chance to get to know the house more intimately. When the MVLA purchased the house in the 1850s and opened it to the public, they began transforming it into what we know today. As a restored glimpse of what Mount Vernon probably looked like around 1799 when Washington died, as a major tourist attraction with infrastructure to bring people to the site and to educate and entertain them while they're there, and as one of the most heavily documented sites in American history. Mount Vernon was probably the most photographed house in America by the end of the 19th century, just as Americans were starting to get their own little cameras to carry around in their pockets. These images were published and passed around and looked at and admired, only furthering the recognizability of Mount Vernon. By the early 20th century, Americans, as well as people from all over the world, could not only visit the real Mount Vernon, but they could also start to see other versions. In 1893, we see the first full-scale replica of Mount Vernon, the Virginia building at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, Illinois. This was a World's Fair visited by millions of people from all over the globe. You might also know it as the White City. Like many other states at the fair, Virginia used its most iconic building to create a headquarters for the state and to teach visitors about its history and culture. The interiors of the building copied Mount Vernon's and were full of items that made it feel like a home, like you were stepping into the real thing, including some items that belonged to Washington himself. This replica proves that by the end of the 19th century, Americans knew what Mount Vernon looked like, and they could depend on others to recognize it too. It also gets us to the third reason why Mount Vernon is replicated so often and so widely. Mount Vernon is malleable. Its architecture is flexible. The Virginia building was just the start of certain groups of Americans using the house's distinct, recognizable architecture to connect themselves to Washington and other ideas about the American past. To legitimize their ideas and to project them to a wide audience via its clear, simple architectural features. One of the most dramatic examples of this is a replica that was never built. 
In 1917, a Baptist preacher named Charles Lewis Fowler opened a university in Atlanta, and he began to plant a campus. He hired a local architect and imagined the place to be composed almost entirely of replicas of buildings important to American and specifically Southern American history. Mount Vernon provided inspiration for a dormitory. Arlington House, the home of Robert E. Lee, and Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson, were also included. Fowler imagined that students would become better citizens just by being in and around the replicas of famous American buildings. This is a very similar goal as what the ladies thought when they began to restore Mount Vernon in the 1880s. Just being near Mount Vernon would make us better citizens. Fowler wrote in the school bulletin, quote, to live in the atmosphere of these buildings and to imbibe the wholesome spirit of the illustrious men and women who made these buildings famous will constitute a liberal education. But Fowler had a more specific idea for the kind of education these buildings would provide. Fowler and his fellow faculty members, including William J. Simmons, were deeply involved in the revival of the Ku Klux Klan in Atlanta in the 1920s. Simmons, who you see here, taught Civil War and Reconstruction history at the New School at the same time that he was the Klan's Imperial Wizard or Supreme Leader. He became president of the university in 1921, taking over from Fowler after the Klan purchased the school with plans to turn it into a, quote, pure American university. The whole thing fell apart in 1922, and only the copy of Arlington House was ever built. It is now a synagogue. But this idea for this campus serves as a striking example of how flexible Mount Vernon was by the early 1920s. It could be used to sell xenophobia and ideas of racial cleansing as easily as anything else. It was a symbol onto which people could project their views of America's past and transform them for the present. Whereas Mount Vernon was integral to Lanier University's very exclusive idea of what was and wasn't American, Mount Vernon's famous piazza and its other architectural features were used to welcome Americans to a new kind of building, the Roadside Motel. The number of American motels doubled over the course of the 1960s as Americans hit the road on newly formed highways. The recognizable piazza of Mount Vernon, or just the red roof and cupola, really, were quick signals to passing cards that these were establishments to be trusted, at a time when motels were still pretty new for most people. These buildings were essentially billboards for the services of hospitality offered within. These roadside Mount Vernons reference the original Mount Vernon in very abstract ways just a few toothpick columns here, or even just the colors of red roof and green cupola. Mount Vernon was famous enough that it could be recognized at a glance, moving 50 miles per hour and with the briefest of architectural forms. And these forms could be used to appeal to a mass market of middle-class American travelers, just as easily as it could be used to communicate a very specific set of political ideas. The recognizability, malleability, and inextricable relationship with Washington has made Mount Vernon's architecture the most replicated in American history. I hope that as you move through the world, you'll not only notice these replicas, but also submit them to Mount Vernon's crowdsource maps of Mount Vernon lookalikes. Use the QR code here to submit yours today. And also check out my book on the history of Mount Vernon in American popular culture. Thank you.